So I'm uh, going to talk about money. I have to warn you, I wasn't the uh, original designated speaker for this topic, and I can assure you that I am totally incapable of running my own finances. <laughs> Next. So what you look at here is the cover of, uh, of the Financing Global Health Report 2012 from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. They bring out a report um, every year and it, it looks at, at money flows for, for global health. And this uh, report is, has the subtitle, The End of the Golden Age? Question mark. And if you look, there's been, over, over the years, there's been a remarkable development in, um, in actually uh, money uh, development assistance for health. In 1990, the total uh, ODA budget, official development assistance uh, budget, was about 100 million, and only 6%, even less, less than 6% of that, was, uh, was uh, for health. That changed over time. In 2001, it was more than 10%, around 12%, and the budget had not grown. Uh, and then, of course, with the big funding mechanisms uh, coming into existence in the, in the early 2000s, suddenly there was uh, much more money for global health, and the proportion of ODA money going to health was approximately uh, 20%. This is a slide from, uh, from the report, and you see that this is the development assistance for health, and you do see that it's leveling off here. The, uh, the, the highest uh, amount was uh, actually in 2010, a little less in 2011, and now we're still a little bit under the 28.2 uh, billion uh, that was um, uh, designated to health in 2000, uh, 2010. This is overall money for health, so it's not, not uh, specific for, uh, for HIV, uh, but obviously HIV, malaria, and TB take up a large uh, chunk of that. As has been said several times already yesterday, ODA is under pressure. Uh, we're moving from a unipolar to a multipolar world. Um, economic crisis and low growth rates in, in Europe and the US make, uh, make certainly uh, some countries less uh, prone to, uh, to be generous in, uh, with development assistance for health. In fact, my own country uh, used to be on, on, at the very top with, with the Scandinavian countries and Luxembourg, and, and recently uh, cut, its, uh, cut its contribution considerably uh, by more than a billion. Um, there's rapid growth in other countries and regions, it's, uh, and, and of course uh, we pay the price of democracy. Um, if we have a lot of populist politicians who actually play the anti-immigrant card and etc. etc. and it, it really takes away the, 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 the support in the populace uh, for, uh, for overseas uh, aid. We see these publications, it's funny because The Economist, as was also uh, referred to yesterday, only a few years ago had uh, a cover saying Africa the lost continent and now suddenly Africa is rising, which is definitely true. If you go to Nairobi, it's unbelievable. Every other six months, it's, uh, it's changed, and uh, there's a lot of d dynamics, I think, with mobile technologies, too far ahead of, uh, of anybody else, the use of mobile technologies. But it doesn't mean that we can let Africa uh, go at this point in time, because there's also the rural part of Africa, and that's a, that's a different story. Again, ODA is under pressure. In fact, more poor people now live in middle-income countries than in low-income countries, and should we be paying for that? You have so many rich people in those countries, and uh, it's, it's really a matter of distribution uh, to, a, to a certain extent. But then some of these countries have a high HIV burden, and it would still be very difficult for them to take care of it themselves. And also, we don't want to let the poor people be the victims of, let's say, the, the greed of the, of the rich in those countries. This slide is, uh, I hope you can see it, but it's, it's really remarkable. Here, um, it's, um, uh, let's see, is it Dali? I need my reading glasses, my age is showing. <laughs> Maybe I'm better there. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the column on the, the column here is, is, the, is the disease burden. Um, as measured by DALIS, and here you have the ranking uh, according to the amount of development assistance for health uh, given. 
and, and you see there's, there's some really strange things here. India is, is, uh, is actually number one with regards to disease burden and also gets the highest amount uh, for the development assistance for health. You can question whether a country that's, that has an atom bomb actually uh, deserves to get that money, but that's the way it is. And then you have a country like uh, Tanzania, which is somewhere here. I, here, which is number 11 with regards to disease burden, but then if you look at support, it is number three. Uh, and then Rwanda is, is even uh, more striking. Rwanda is somewhere down here, I think, here. And then it also, it, I think they're, they're here. So that obviously a lot of politics into, into play. It's, it's obvious that the US wants to, uh, to have a stable base in, in East Africa. Um, the good news we heard yesterday was, uh, of course, that uh, from, from Luis, uh, that actually countries are contributing more and more. And, and in 2011, for the first time, um, if you look at the resources available for HIV, the low and middle income countries uh, contributed more than, than the donors. But it's a very uneven picture. Obviously, countries like Brazil, Argentina, etc., are, are taking up the majority of. Uh, of, of the funding uh, themselves, but you have uh, basket cases like Congo, etc., uh, Sudan, uh, South Sudan, uh, that obviously cannot cannot do it on their own. And also Nigeria is uh, is uh, is uh, is this? Let's see, no, Nigeria is here. No, that's a mistake. And, and we're still far. If you the, if you remember, in uh, in 2011, uh, Bernard Shortlander and others. Uh, published a paper in, in, in Lancet about an investment uh, framework for HIV and uh, they came to the conclusion that we needed uh, over 20 billion uh, dollars per year by 2015 and of course that's not happening. And if we want really to see the end of AIDS, another uh, optimistic economist uh, cover, then we will have to come up with the money. And for that, we need to look at innovative financing. We, we have heard many times now governments don't look ahead. They, they look at an election cycle. They're not going to invest now for the, for the future. And yet we have to do that if, if we want to make this happen. So in, in, 2011, in 2012, there was an interesting um, article in Lancet by the Task Force for on Innovative Financing for Health Systems, which reviewed uh, more than 100 innovative financing initiatives and, uh, to identify airline tax, tobacco tax, immunization bonds, advanced market commissions, and debt swaps as the most promising sources for new and additional funding. But they limited themselves then to only three, because these were the only ones that had reached global scale in their operations and funding. So Gavi, the Global Funding Unit Aid. Let's first have a look of Gavi, my own personal favorite, I must say. Um, Gavi is a relatively small player, uh, but what's interesting about Gavi, although they're very important, obviously, for vaccines and immunizations, is that 36% uh, f of their uh, contributions come from the innovative finance of immunization that was uh, actually conceived by Gordon Brown when he was still uh, chancellor in, uh, in the UK. And I think the innovative finance of immunization is a type of a model that we might be willing to look at for funding the scale-up of antiretroviral therapy. And Gavi actually is doing very well. And uh, in 2012, it, uh, it had an uh, over 40% increase in funding over 2011, so different from some of the other uh, organizations. What is the IFFIM? It's, a, it's an innovative way to use official development uh, assistance. And it issues bonds in the capital markets to convert long-term government pledges to immediately available cash resources. Um, and these bonds are sold against legally binding long-term ODA commitments from the UK, France, Italy, Spain, Sweden, the Netherlands, Norway, and South Africa, which together have pledged to contribute 5.9 billion over 23 years. Now, if this is possible for immunization, why wouldn't it be possible for, um, for the treatment scale-up? Because in the end, of course, in the treatment scale-up, we're also going to see a decrease of, uh, of costs. 
And, and by creating a de predictable demand pool, IFFIM addresses a major constraint to immunization scale-up, the scarcity of stable, predictable, and coordinated cash flows for an extended period. So that, that's essential, especially in the vaccine business, but it is also essential, I think, to keep, for instance, generic producers interested in, 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 uh, in staying in the HIV field. And maybe superfluous, but in green you see the contribution that the percentage contribution and, and absolute contribution that IFIM makes to uh, to the Gavi funding. Then the global fund. I, I must say that I'm not sure why they call that innovative. Maybe because of the the different, uh, the, let's say, the governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but in in a way, it's it's still. Most of the money comes from, from traditional donors. Um, but uh, by June 2011, the Global Fund had uh, committed about uh, almost uh, 30 million, um, but most of, uh, over 30 million, but almost all of that came from traditional uh, donors. And the, the private money is mainly from the Gates uh, Foundation, but that's really uh, very little compared to the, in blue, you see what the donor countries have contributed. The good news is um, that in, at the fourth replenishment meeting in, in DC, an initial amount of $12 billion was pledged over the next three years, which is a 30% increase over the amount pledged in 2010 at the start of the 2011-2013 period. So on one hand, a success. On the other hand, it's less than is needed. And here we see the, the development assistance for health for HIV AIDS by channel of assistance. And in what's clear is that the, this is uh, the dark here is the, that the United States, uh, mainly PEPFAR, and, and, and the Global Fund are really the big uh, drivers of the increase in, uh, in funding for, um, for HIV AIDS. Also, if you look at uh, funding for HIV AIDS, you get these strange discrepancies between disease burden and, um, and the amount of money uh, spent. And again, Rwanda is, uh, is low here, but is high here. Then Unit Aid, interesting. It was established in 2006 to raise additional funds for global health and to complement efforts to expand treatment of HIV AIDS, malaria, and TB in low and middle income countries. And uh, by the end of 2010, Unit 8 raised about 1.3 billion, around 70%, which came from a, from a levy imposed uh, in six countries on, uh, on airline tickets. This was an initiative of France. Um, other countries were uh, quite critical. My own country didn't want to participate because they said these French don't give enough uh, uh, regular foreign aid and uh, now they're, they're playing us this trick so we're not going to join. But I think it's actually, it has done a lot of good and it is an innovative uh, mechanism. And there are also contributions from Brazil, Spain, the UK, France and, uh, and the Gates Foundation. And, and Unidate is actually... Uh, been uh, been quite successful in, in collaboration with the Clinton Health Access Initiative to, to get substantial price reductions, uh, especially second line therapy, and also they're they're really pushing for pediatric and retroviral medicines. And you see here an example of price uh, reductions, median price reductions of uh, WHO recommended first line regimens in low and middle income countries. And it's quite a dramatic fall, and we, prices have fallen even further now, and the same is true for second line regimens. What is this is another slide on, um, on, on development assistance for health over time. And what's remarkable here is that you see that until, let's say, 2000 to 2003, almost all the development assistance went to governments. And then something happens because here you see the total amount of development assistance for health. Um, and you see that actually a larger part goes to the non-governmental sector. So to NGOs, universities, uh, private, or private uh, uh, providers, etc., etc., And there may be a good reason for that. I'm just uh, hypothesizing here. Because if you look at what happened, for instance, it's from the, uh, the Institute of Health Metrics uh, uh, and Evaluation Financial, uh, Financing Global Health Report 2011. They showed that over the period 2006-2007, uh, you see that uh, the uh, assistance to um, 
for health to, to government increased by uh, 324 million. But that led to less spending by the governments themselves. So this is called crowding out or fungibility, and there has also been a Lancet paper in a year before on that. And then if you see the money that goes to non-governmental organizations, you actually see there is more spending by the government for health. So there's a correlation here. And of course, it doesn't have to be a causal relationship. But one of the hypotheses is that actually because these NGOs uh, pay higher salaries, the government is also forced to pay uh, to pay higher salaries and, and thus has to spend more on health. But of course, this is this negative, uh, this less spending by domestic governments is not something that you really uh, would like to encourage. Although it may go to good use as such as education. I'm nearly done, but I, we have to realize that, that we're actually quite fortunate in the HIV. We're not getting enough, but the real neglected diseases are actually the NCDs and not these uh, neglected tropical diseases. The NCDs are actually killing more people than all those diseases combined. And if you look at the amount of funding available for NCDs in, in poor countries, it's dismal. It's a, it's a hundredfold less than the money going to, uh, to, uh, to, to the rest. Uh, of, um, of health. And if you look at the disease burden in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, 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 the causes of mortality, cardiovascular disease is overtaking HIV. And in, in a decade or so, it will actually have overtaken uh, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria as a, as a cause of death. So we need to move from AIDS exceptionalism to health exceptionalism. And it would really be a missed opportunity if, if, if we massively scale up antiretroviral therapy, as I wholeheartedly want, it would not be utilized to confer additional health benefits to both HIV positives and negatives. For instance, detection and treatment of hypertension. And as most of you will know, there's this fantastic search project in Uganda run by, uh, by Moses Kamiya and, uh, and Diane Heffler that's really looking at, at treating HIV and, and NCDs at the same time. And I really think that's the way forward. And then we have hepatitis C. And it's been mentioned earlier, but we also need to come up with a way to treat hepatitis C virus in, in resource poor settings. There are all kinds of issues there, but it has to happen. So in conclusion, um, we need sustainable financing of healthcare, not just HIV programs. We have to make sure that donor support does not decrease. Uh, and I firmly believe that investing in health and education actually pays off. My government doesn't think so anymore, but I, I, they haven't looked at the data. Um, and then we also do have to reduce inefficiencies in donor funding, avoid crowding out, and, and obviously, as is happening, involve the private sector if the government is not able to deliver the services. We need to leverage donor funding to attract investments. We've actually done that quite successfully. We got 100 million of the Dutch government to roll out health insurance in a number of uh, African countries. And by having that public money uh, more or less as a, as a buffer, as a, as a guarantee that people would come to the clinic, uh, we could actually attract uh, this investment fund uh, for health in Africa, which was founded. And that has had its first cloning already. Has, uh, closing has invested more than, uh, than 50 uh, 50 million in health in, in Africa, so that's a way to, to, to use donor money. Uh, we need to increase national health budgets, it's also been said yesterday, uh, and African countries need to be held to the uh, accountable for a budget declaration, and we need to establish sustainable financing mechanisms such as risk pooling, health insurance. And now I have a brief film, only two minutes, uh, and then we're done. Our world, Africa's world, we are more alike than we think. But there is one big difference. Healthcare. We have a plan, a bright idea. 
Together, we can improve access to quality health care in Africa. Support us. Match health insurance here to health insurance there. And people who care to people who need care. We find each other. That's what it's all about. Joy. Just to explain, this is an initiative that uh, we took with the biggest health insurer in the Netherlands and basically when people take health insurance they can uh, donate an extra amount monthly to actually buy insurance for people in Sub-Saharan Africa and it's probably going to be expanded to, uh, to a lot of other countries as well. So. <laughs>